This edition of the Ridley Report is brought to you by... This is the skeleton for a book I started writing about New Hampshire's ever-colorful free staters back in the day when people could still make money writing a book. Free staters are people who moved to New Hampshire for more liberty, and you can sign up to join them by visiting freestateproject.org. As of 2014, roughly 16,000 had essentially pledged to move here, and roughly 1,600 of those had already carried out their promise. Since the book will not be finished for years, or probably ever, I'm publishing bits and, piece of, bits and pieces of it as a m- sort of micro-audio books on the Ridley Report. If I sense that reaction is profitable, I may resume work on the project, pulling it off the shelf. The writing is modeled on Winston Churchill's series about World War I, which is uh, probably the best nonfiction work I've ever read. It's written in the same archaic style. The Granite Flower, Part 1, The Desperate Plan, 2001-2003. to Preface. From September 2002 until August of 2004, I was one of a thousand, then three thousand, then six thousand, disaffected free marketeers, bent on the enactment of a desperate scheme. The idea was simple, controversial, and quintessentially American. These like-minded dissidents, scattered across the country and even the very earth, would uproot themselves and become neighbors, concentrated in, yet spread across, a single U.S. state. Upon completing their escapes, each would fulfill a pledge to, quote, exert the fullest practical effort toward creation of a society in which the maximum role of civil government is the protection of life, liberty, and property, unquote. This period roughly comprises the first stage in the growth of our movement, our free state project, the publication of an obscure essay, the creation of a vibrant online community and recruitment to its cause, the selection of a welcoming sanctuary for our families in lost freedoms, all these achievements would unfold with exhilarating speed, and they would be eclipsed by events which were to follow, triumphs, blunders, occurrences far beyond our defective control, and many others of our own creation. In August '04, the project ceased to be a dream for me and became reality as I manically packed a rented trailer and drove it to the newly designated free state of New Hampshire, sight unseen. I was to find myself drawn deep into relatively hazardous events of uncertain outcome and, once there, enjoyed constant opportunities to witness an as-yet-unrecognized history unfolding. It seems appropriate to set forth the manner in which I and others sought to discharge our vows during these unfoldings. In doing so, I have modeled upon another freedom fighter of sorts, whose story will forever outshine this one. His writing method is so compelling it cannot but be imitated right down to the alien spellings. Winston Churchill's many histories rarely unfold with complete objectivity more often displaying his vantage point at the center of events. That is where he always seemed to be. Despite his partiality, Churchill delivered these, delivered these stories with a relative accuracy peculiar among political memoirs. Of these writings, the most striking is his six-book history of World War I, The World Crisis. Archaic in style, even by 1921 standards, this gently composed, heartbreaking tale links even the least sympathetic of readers to Britain's great war cause. It chronicles the blunders, the unspeakable sacrifices, the ultimate victory of a flawed endeavor against a voracious tyranny. So compelling is his telling of the tragedy that even a soul who has lost most, most faith in other political leaders cannot help but retain a bit in him. Perhaps I will forgive if I am perfectly seek to accomplish something comparable, both the chronicling and the accession of initially skeptical readers to our endeavor. 
Perhaps the old lion, if he is still watching, will not think me uncreative in adapting his method to this history, or to a type of freedom fight which was never wholly his own. Perhaps it will not be thought inappropriate if one paragraph in four, roughly, borrows closely from his articulation of a great war detail and adapts it to our own uncertain enterprise. Whatever Sir Winston's policy failings from the minarchist perspective, in his action and stances he got many things right. As a young subaltern, he criticized his commander in print over the slaughter of Egyptian rebels. Or rebels. He fought prostitution laws and prohibition, fought communism and fascism, ultimately Stalin and Hitler themselves in one form or another. In the Great War, he pleaded for an end to fruitless slaughter and ultimately provided a means to that end. History, truly written after living memory has passed, may judge him in increasingly searching terms for the means by which he defended his island race from the dark, uh, for, or from the Nazi Dark Age. But the wise among our offspring will judge him and perhaps all their enemies only as he judged his, reluctantly with a bias toward forgiveness. His historical writings can be but little impeached. Hopefully this chronicle will direct certain new readers to his work and his website, winstonchurchill.org. Meanwhile, we have been condemned to live in interesting times, and there is nothing for it but to tell our colorful tale. Dave Ridley, Manchester, New Hampshire, October 7th, 2007. Most talk radio sucks. What if you found a show that wanted to end the war on drugs? Would you listen? Join us for the number one pro-liberty talk show, Free Talk Live. Listen live or via podcast for free at freetalklive.com.